How you going, Jay? Hey, what's up, guys? Sorry, I was on desktop. <laughs> uh, no worries. Uh, I figured that that might be the uh, the issue. Yeah, I've actually never used Faces, even though I've done, you know, like probably like twenty or thirty clubhouses at this point. <laughs> <laughs> no, these are these are really cool, man. Because uh, you know you already have your audience on your Twitter, so it's oh such yeah, an easy totally. Way. I think this is gonna crush Clubhouse actually. Um, Clubhouse is still really good for like kind of the high net worth group, just because it went from top down from uh, the VC crowds. So it's still worthwhile to to try and capture that attention or of that kind of demographic. But I think I don't know. This is more for everybody else. Um, and also just like leveraging your existing connections on Clubhouse, you kind of just have to start from the ground up. Yeah. I mean, as, as you know, uh, that's kind of like a lot of us always talk about that, like the, the importance of the network effect in crypto. But I mean, you can even see it play out in the traditional tech arena as well. Um, you know, once you have that initial network, you just kind of offer up a new product that competes with somebody who has like a amazing new product, but doesn't have the network. And it's pretty easy to crush the competition if you execute pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, it's actually like crazy to see how, if there's a killer app, for example, or, or like a, like a early signs of a killer app, then all of the major players just rip it and there's no recourse whatsoever. Yeah, the really fascinating thing I find with, like, the Clubhouse space's difference is, like you said, like, they started with the Silicon Valley VC crowd, and they started invite only. So it kind of, like, for the first few months was just this internal echo chamber. Yeah, um, totally. And now it's kind of just running off of this limited group. Like, I still don't have the invite to Clubhouse, and it's almost been out, like, a year. So, like, yeah, I, I think... Twitter spaces like you can you can type in hashtag spaces through the search thing and every space on Twitter pops up so like you can literally join a group that you don't you've never talked to before counter opinion all this type of stuff like I think it's more a broader brush like everyone has a voice in spaces if the speaker allows you to I guess but um, yeah I, I think the conversations being held on Clubhouse really interesting with the group that started it, but I don't think too many general people have a voice because, like, you pretty much had to be tied in through the invite system through people who were semi-important who got the first round, right? So, like, it's yeah. still slowly trickling out to the public. I know a few people that, like, have 9-to-5s that are on Clubhouse now, but... I'd say a majority of people can't even get access to. Yeah, totally, man. I mean, that was kind of their whole concept, being an exclusive club. Well, this is uh, way way more open. Yeah. Jay, I mean... what do you uh, what do you think of like the El Salvador news? Oh man, I mean, I think it's interesting to say the least. I don't know. I think actually there's one, a lot of um, people that have been in the space for a while, they have just, you know, different types of opinions. I've been in the space for a fair amount of time too. I, I've been trading Bitcoin since 2011 and was professionally involved um, as a marketer since 2016. So that's kind of the timeline I'm working with. And for what it's worth, the 2011 to 2015 trading times was was just not even serious. It was... It was just me trying to figure out why this magic internet money called Bitcoin was appreciating and depreciating at incredible rates. And I think that obviously led to a little bit more of a serious focus for, for me, at least. Um, and I think seeing the news, so, so given that timeline, seeing that news is actually incredible. Because if you had told me that that was going to happen back in 2012, 2013, I would not have believed it at all. Really, I, I couldn't even fathom that type of use case, to be honest. Now, I think as probably everybody knows here, crypto is very, very good at saying one thing and doing something else. So we'll see what actually happens with this and, and see what 
um, adoption or lack thereof really looks like. So I'm not really holding my breath on this news until maybe like even like later this fall. Um, I don't think the effects are really going to start kicking in if they do until then. No, that makes sense. I mean, uh, I believe on the call they mentioned like they have 90 days to implement. So really curious to see uh, what happens. And I was also really surprised that they weren't mandating everyone to use a government wallet. Like you can pretty much use whatever, whatever wallet you want. Um, so I am really curious around like how they're going to track taxes and transactions if any, everyone can use just any system. Did you guys see that you can get citizenship with just ownership of three Bitcoin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That, yeah, I mean, that's like one of many interesting implications. <laughs> um, Jay, quick question for you since you've been in the space longer. With El Salvador making it their currency, do you think it gets added to like the Forex index and traded like ROW and all that shit? Like now that it's essentially kind of like the euro of el salvador you know what i mean like c couldn't it be yeah. considered a forex currency now i i mean just because it's legal tender doesn't mean forex platforms have to accept it because forex platforms aren't trading all global currencies right so kind of the same idea now i'm not i don't have a traditional finance background i learned finance through crypto because i was exposed to crypto first before any of uh, like traditional equities so I kind of had to do backwards learning um, and really just understand like philosophically what money is, what credits and debits are, like really basic stuff just to kind of realign all of my understanding from the bottom up. Because one thing I realized is like when, when you had, you know, uh, let's say like let's pick Bitcoin, for example, if you had some of the like fixed cap narratives, um, a lot of the ways in which mining works and, and basically uh, mints these tokens I at the time when I first learned about it I couldn't wrap my head around it that well because I didn't really understand how the Fed worked at least in the US that's where I'm based and so you can see how like I had to kind of go backwards but with my understanding now I mean I'm pretty well versed in in traditional finance at this point um, I, I, I still really think it's up to whoever's controlling these products and platforms and uh, and I, I don't know what enough about FX and and what drives value there from a I guess like trading perspective and what um, is most appealing to FX platforms I guess if you will so that's kind of where my opinion stopped short but I mean could be worthwhile for them to consider but I don't know if it would fall under the FX territory. Yeah, that that's my pretty much same opinion. I've seen a lot of people. Basically, their bull case is forming around it becoming a forex based off the El Salvador news. I don't. I, I believe it's possible, but I don't necessarily believe it's automatically the case becoming legal tender. Um, like you said like the exchanges have to facilitate it and add it into the forex ecosystem, and basically acknowledge it as part of FX. Um, and I, I think it may stay on crypto a little longer before that happens. But yeah. I think it's interesting to see if that really becomes multiple nations legal tender. I think it may have to be added to FX in, in the next few years. I think the, the overarching interesting implication about all this is for the first time in history, you have a government mandating something effectively. And so now you're going to have people that would have never, ever thought of touching Bitcoin ever now like not saying that they'll guarantee touch it, but it's much more likely that they will interact with it some way or somehow. So it's kind of like how China, uh, their um, very authoritarian government, they mandate the use of a lot of technology. So like um, WeChat, all of these uh, software companies that you know coming out of China, the reason why they get quick, fast adoption is because you have all of these different governments or sorry, rather the, the regions within the governments mandating the use of it. And so that's kind of one of the pain points that I think the U S has where the U S it's open and free, or I guess in relation to China. And so innovation sometimes takes a while and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of money involved, uh, lobbying and, and it's basically just a game of influence as opposed to China's just like 
overnight, boom, you have adoption. A hundred percent. Jay, I'm, I'm curious, like, how'd you wind up at Ava Labs? Yeah, I don't know if it, the story is actually as as interesting as maybe people think, but it was basically, uh, it was, was part of a firm called Fluidity that was acquired by Consensus, so very much in the Ethereum space. I was there for about two and a half years, and I was leading marketing there, um, primarily focused on decentralized exchanges, so one was called AirSwap, and then the other side of the business was security tokens. And from that end, you basically dealt with the crypto DGENs on the DEX side. And then on the digital security side, you dealt with institutions and a lot of traditional finance firms. And so from there, I think uh, John Wu, who actually was the guy that reached out to me, he, I think, knew of the work that I was doing on the digital security side. We were chatting a bunch um, last April, and then he was like, hey, Avalabs is looking for someone to scale up the marketing function. Would love for you to join. And that's kind of how it happened. Damn, that's crazy. It's the net it's the network effect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And what's funny is I've noticed I mean, it seems like this group is fairly Chainlink focused. So like Adeline Joe, she's the CMO of Chainlink. We are very good friends. We joined the space uh, more or less at the same time. She's way less degen oriented than i am like i'm in all of the yield farms and i'm i'm definitely trading on a day-to-day basis so we talk yeah, exactly so we talk about uh she comes in from a traditional background so we both share traditional marketing uh like passion for traditional marketing and then i think i definitely bring forth like hey this is what's happening in fortune this is what you're going to need to know uh at least because she is the cmo of champing <laughs> that's how it is <laughs> That is awesome. Yeah, so we we go a long way. It's it's I mean, it's no accident that the link community is pretty close with the Avox community. That's really really cool. Um, I feel like we do have a lot of people in here that don't um, know about Avalanche and don't realize like what the protocol is. Could you kind of give like a like a brief introduction for like a complete newbie that that doesn't even know anything about about the protocol? Yeah, so Avalanche is the fastest, most secure smart contracts platform out right now. And so that's the one-liner. Now let me unpack that really quickly. (laughs) The reason why it's the most secure is because it can scale up to potentially millions and millions of validators. What we have right now is we have a network of a thousand validators. um, And I would say there are some things that are limiting that beyond the thousand. And it has nothing to do with the technical aspects of it. It's just basically like one Uh, example I always give is we decided that there was a minimum staking value um, when we launched and when we launched the token was trading at way less than it is now Mm -hmm. and so as you can imagine with market volatility but also just token appreciation that minimum staking value becomes a little bit prohibitive so we're looking to change that Um, I I actually maybe not we as Avalabs but I think we might leave it up to governance just so people in the community can decide what is the appropriate amount to have staked. But last I checked, and I, and this market's kind of been crazy the last month or so, but the last time I checked, it was like 50k US to, to stake. So as you can imagine, maybe for the American crowd, it's not terrible. Uh, it's not a terribly high amount, but for the rest of the world, it's pretty prohibitive. Um, and on the flip side, if you're talking about the hardware that's required to run a validator, you can run it on something as small as a Raspberry Pi. Um, you could also run it on your uh, on on uh, uh, in the cloud if you wanted to. So it's really not intensive in resources, and that's because it's a proof using proof of stake. It's not um, we're not mining at least on the avalanche side. And um, let's see. I think oh, and the reason why I would say it's it's very very fast is just because of the consensus protocol. So or the consensus mechanism, and this consensus mechanism was developed by. Uh, one of our co-founders, Amin Gunsir, and also Kevin Sekniki and, and a few others. And basically what you have is it's, it's a, the third generation consensus protocol after Bitcoin, um, our classical consensus and Nakamoto consensus, which was introduced using Bitcoin. So we're basically tackling the space from the ground up. Now, if you look at CoinMarketCap, for example, you'll see the thousands and thousands of uh, tokens. And then within them, you'll see also blockchains, that are using 
consensus mechanisms one way or another, right? And a lot of those consensus mechanisms are just basically variants of existing mechanisms that have proved to have difficulties scaling. So that was kind of our thesis saying, why are we just trying to incrementally improve stuff that doesn't work with a user base of like, I don't know, let's let me let's call it let's call the DeFi user base 3 million users. So imagine if you wanted to scale to the demands of the world, 3 million is not even close to that. And and that's where we were saying, okay, I think the only way to really minimize the time to market, if you will, or time to mainstream market is to really focus on the ground up um, and, and take it from there. Wow, <laughs> that's, that's definitely a lot of a lot of information to consume. I mean, you guys are taking on a massive, a massive, massive uh, project. Um, you know, really kudos to your team for building out, um, building out the project and being at where it's at today. Um, besides the protocol, can you also dive into like an introduction to the AVEX uh, token and how and how that plays into the protocol? Yeah, sure. So the AVEX token right now is is mainly just a base unit of account for the Avalanche protocol. In the future, there'll be governance mechanisms. We don't really have that much clarity publicly as to what that looks like, um, but that is uh, something that is coming in the near future. The other thing that I mentioned earlier in this call is um, using AVEX for staking. So you can actually help Basically, the, the simple way to say validating or explain what validating is, is you can s help to keep Avalanche secure while also processing the transactions and verifying them. And um, as so long as you meet the minimum staking requirement, you can earn up to 11% APY. No, that's that's amazing. I mean, what's what's staking? Um, is there any like risks like associated with with actually staking your coins? No, so unlike a lot of smart contract platforms, staking on Avalanche doesn't get slashed if you don't meet the uptime requirements. Instead, you just don't receive those rewards during if if you don't meet those requirements. Oh, that's that's actually really, 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 really cool. Um, and like you said, like basically the technical requirements for actually running your own. Um, node are, are pretty low. Um, what was the thought process like around that, that basically anyone could, could start doing that? Yeah, so one of the things that Goon actually has said many, many times is he wants to see a world where people can just run Avalanche on their phone and help maintain the network. And so that's kind of the end vision. And that just basically is democratization in a nutshell, right? And so when it comes to also making that vision happen, what do you need to do? You need to make sure that it's as easy and um, as as easy and kind of flexible, if you will, as possible for the end user. So right now, I think the hardware requirements are, are low and it's still not really clear as to how far we could push those requirements, I guess. Um, I believe also with certain improvements, those requirements get lowered as well. And then I think in the meantime, while we're trying to figure out how best to uh, I guess, optimize the platform while also keeping it as stable as possible. One of the biggest challenges I would say about having something, a major platform or network in production, we're actually partnering with a lot of um, staking as a service providers, just so people who don't necessarily have the development background can also validate or, or even delegate um, use it on, on Avalanche. And so like one, like one company that comes to mind is like Anchor. So you can sign up for an account uh, just use an easy to use front end and and stake your uh, stake your Avox if you wanted to. Damn, that's actually really really cool. So basically, your vision is, hey, I'd be able to go to the app store, down download an app, and then just start start validating. Yeah, I mean, I think even more simply put, it's just how do I get from point A to point B as fast as possible? Um, because I think staking, I mean, I mean, all of this, actually, everything that we're talking about is still so, so complex. And one of the things that I always say with uh, Web2, for example, is like, you're not going around the world and saying, oh, my God, I can't believe what TCP IP is going to bring to the world. Like, it's going to be the best. You, you, you instead say, oh, well, 
this Uber application is going to bring you from point A to point B um, by also empowering drivers all across the world. Like that's what you talk about, not the underlying protocol. So I think right now we're at a very kind of key moment where a lot of people are realizing that. And I think people have been rumbling about, you know, kind of simplifying the message for a while now. And I think like I, we were t- saying before about the, the, um, the El Salvador news and, and things like that, like, it, it, people say one thing in crypto and it, it usually takes a, a significant amount of time. And it's basically because the technology is so complex. And there's so many moving pieces. And there's also just a really small, small uh, group of active users at the end of the day. So it's, it's a little bit harder to, to move quickly and safely, if I were to say it correctly. No, that that makes sense. Um, I'm also kind of curious around, like, you know, your vision of having, like, om- like basically anyone being able to to download and and do this. Um, do you guys have like any vision of incentivizing um, people to sign up, almost like a referral style program to kind of uh, encourage mass adoption? Yeah, we're we're definitely keen on that. Um, whenever we can figure out a a clear path forward. I think for staking, our biggest blocker still is the minimum staking requirement. So before, until we figure that out, I think we're not necessarily trying to open the floodgates just yet. And also it's it's like, okay, we are adding dApps, like probably, I don't really know the exact number, but probably around like, I don't know, a dozen of dApps on a weekly basis or bi-weekly basis uh, to be a little bit more conservative on the estimate. And from that perspective, you also have a lot of load coming in. And so one of the things that we also need to make sure is, hey, let's keep keep everything as stable as possible. There's a lot of um, things involved. Like, for example, one of the things that I found very interesting to learn early at my time at Ava Labs is it doesn't matter how fast your blockchain platform moves. If the infrastructure, for example, like MetaMask, for example, has slow APIs, then it's just going to act as as uh, slow as your kind of like weakest link, if you will. So that's also a challenge because at the end of the day, the customer is not going to care or the user is not going to care about that nuance. They're just going to be like, oh, your application is, um, let's say like your, or sorry, with the platform, your platform settles transactions in, uh, in five seconds. And that's actually something that I saw just recently and actually, if on Avalanche, if you look at how fast the blocks are processed, it's usually about a second or two. And the reason why the five-second number is quoted is because a lot of people are interfacing with these dApps using MetaMask. So MetaMask is actually slowing down the appearance of Avalanche, if you will. So it's technically faster than what people can see in MetaMask. Just at least, like, yeah, at least in the dApps. And, and the decision to use MetaMask was just like, MetaMask has the largest user base uh, in terms of desktop extensions, right? So, and, and what's funny is one of my closest friends is the product lead on MetaMask. He's, he's, his name's Gal Eldar, one of, the, one of the more talented product leads in the space, I, I think. And, and I talked to him all the time and I said like, hey, like, what are, what are we thinking about MetaMask? Like, where are we at? He's like, MetaMask was built... It, it just like at such an early stage that at this point it just became this beast. And so it's very hard to maneuver. Um, and so we've been talking to them just about like just general discussions and, and things like that. And at the end of the day, like it's still kind of this clunky tool, but it's still kind of the best clunky tool. So I think that's where we're at now. So I'm hoping in like the next year or so, there's going to be a lot more um, easy to use uh, browser extensions or maybe other types of extension or uh, wallets. I think there are some early participants that have tried to take on the ease of use narrative, like Magic, for example, with like passwordless logins. Um, and then on the other side, Portis, I think, does something similar. But again, like these things came second or third or fourth after MetaMask and MetaMask had basically been here since the beginning of Ethereum. And so they like first mover advantage or first mover in, in, in crypto means a lot, um, at least for like the first three to five years. Yeah, I would, uh, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, bring it back to the uh, protocol you had talked about, like the, the growth you guys are seeing and the amount of dApps that you're seeing move over on a weekly basis. How I understand it, you guys have multiple chains, 
right? So you have the X chain, the P chain, and the C chain. Yeah. Uh, could you kind of dive into like the uh, like the X chain? Yeah. So I can I can go over all of them. From all intents and purposes, you basically have two chains. The P chain is the metadata layer, so that's basically helping the blockchain run or the platform run rather. The X chain is is the exchange chain. It's actually the P chain platform chain. That's kind of the easiest way to remember it. Um, X chain is the exchange chain. It's actually a DAG, um, and so it's able to process payments much quicker than a totally ordered blockchain like the contract chain. And so the contract chain is for smart contracts, and that's where all of the dApps exist. So right now, our strategy is to really prioritize the dApp ecosystem because that's what's really adding value, especially as it pertains to DeFi. Um, and also, you're seeing on, just like broadly speaking, a lot of really, really big players coming through to Ava Labs and saying, hey, like three or four years ago, we knew about blockchain. We wanted to get involved. We didn't know what to do then hit 2017 and they got scared off a little bit and they were like maybe we might wait until the dust settles and then they think now and maybe there's a few more boom and bust cycles that need to happen but we're seeing a lot more serious conversations and even proof of concepts happen and so these proof of concepts i think are really strong indicators and a lot of them actually are in kind of the contract space because i think people are now willing to take the plunge because they're saying like okay DeFi is kind of the proof of concept now what can these legacy enterprises do with what they're seeing in DeFi, it's not exactly clear, to be honest, as to what that looks like, because this permissionless versus permission, like public versus private paradigm is still something that they can't really wrap their heads around. Because of course, like you're not going to want a Fortune 500, or sorry, the Fortune 500 company is not going to want to lift up their walled garden instantaneously. So like, one thing that interests me a lot is zero knowledge proofs. And I think that's something that could really enable economies of scale in a permissionless environment while also keeping permissioned um, instances that effectively work off the permissionless core, if you will. So we have uh, these capabilities called subnets. And subnets allow for enterprises and institutions specifically to create custom rule sets. So you can say like, hey, if you have these checks, let's say KYC and AML, you could trade within this kind of closed off environment if you wanted. And if you don't, then you're not gonna be able to do that. That's kind of the base use, the kind of the base level um, example. I think there's gonna be plenty more use cases with snub nets. I'm just actually waiting until it's out so then I can see what people do with it and, and innovate using it. Um, quick question. What's, I, I know what KYC is, but what's AML? Anti-money money laundering. Oh, okay. Okay. That makes sense. And KYC is um, uh, know your customer. What, and what, so, what are AML protocols uh, like? Uh, sorry. I was, Chase, go do your question before we switch topic. Um, yeah, I mean, I was just going to ask. So, like, uh, the, the P-Chain kind of allows for expanded wall gardens in a sense. Am I understanding that correctly? Like it kind of a, like it's a paved path of where operations can uh, occur within defined parameters. And that's like what the, the P chain uh, allows. Is that right, Jay? So the P chain is, it allows for staking. That's kind of one of the use cases. And then the other thing is you have this primary network. So that's what the P, C and X chain are a part of. So that's kind of the core. And then off, on the side, if you will, you can have subnets all branching out of it. And these, you can have as many subnets as you want, basically building off of the, the main platform chain. So you basically have this ecosystem of blockchains in some foreseeable future, um, all different shapes and sizes, uh, thanks to subnets. Gotcha, okay. Uh, Super, did you, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so on the X chain, could you possibly provide an asset such like a house or a piece of land as an NFT? And would it be able to go on to the ecosystem through the X chain or how would that work? Yeah, you can mint anything on the X chain. Um, an X chain, just kind of think of it as just a regular blockchain um, effectively, or I guess it's a DAG, so I don't want to keep calling it a blockchain, but just a, like a, you're, you're at kind of any of these platforms. And the 
thing that we're working on right now. And so you, the, the, the challenge is because we have this three chain structure, the thing I always say is like, imagine explaining to your friends, like your non-crypto friends, what a blockchain is. Now imagine explaining what three blockchain is. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we're facing with right now. And I think from a UX perspective too, it's not actually that clean right now. I think it's pretty good, but I think it could be better. So for example, if you want to transfer from X to C chain, you basically have to use a, a wallet or an exchange that has that integrated. And that integration just takes a little bit more time than just integrating one chain. And so just these kind of tiny little points of friction do add up at the end of the day. In some future, I believe sometime this year, seamless transfers will be in effect. So hopefully the end user won't have to think about what they're doing when it comes to these chains that are underneath. And if we're able to achieve that, then that is the, the, the end all solution for, for this kind of usability issue that I'm highlighting. Oh, sweet. I also had another question. This is going to the P chain. Um, so with the subnets, what's stopping malicious actors from creating a public blockchain to build dApps and secure value and then just switch it to a private blockchain? Um, that's a good question. I don't think I know really the answer, but uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I can if you DM me that, I can try and find out the answer. I'd be curious to find that out too. I'm pretty sure... Well, so there's basically a minimum staking requirement that is to be determined for these subnets to be a part of Avalanche. And so to me, staking is just a mechanism to prevent people to be basically having an incentive to attack the network, right? That's kind of base value. Right. So I'm thinking it might have to be tied to the, the staking aspect of things. But again, this is this is still very like it's still pre-launch, so I'm not exactly sure how they've thought of that mechanism. But yeah, just DM or I'll write it down because I think that's actually an interesting question. Yeah, no, I was just curious because um, I know I know a lot of people in the crowd like to hear questions like these, um, especially if people are you know putting their money in protocols. Um, and it was just yeah, it was just one that came across my mind because I know there's a lot of good people in here, but. What's stopping, you know, malicious people? Yeah, of course. The world's um, full of bad I, actors. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Totally. But cool. Awesome. Uh, kind of going off that, uh, could you share any companies that are currently using uh, the P-Chain or are soon to be using? Yeah. So I, I guess it's, are you saying as it relates to subnets? Right. Yeah. So since sub subnets aren't out yet, so no one's really using that function. However, there are companies that are using private deployments of Avalanche. Um, so effectively, if you think about it this way, once subnets is out, you could basically transfer that pub that private deployment, or not transfer, but kind of just redeploy that private instance in a live environment. Um, unfortunately. There are the companies that we're currently working with are not public, but we have we have we have a proof of concept that is complete. It was complete in February, just to give you that uh, perspective. And the unfortunate part is none of the slowness has to do with us. As you can imagine, these massive enterprises have a ton of red tape, and so what's right. crazy is these enterprise life cycles. The customers' life cycles are are like six to twelve months, whereas the DAP and decentralized slash Web three circles, like I've seen projects deploy something in a day, um, because they just need to get get it get it done as quick as possible. So that's kind of so, like the balance that we're dealing with. Yeah, I, I guess a follow up question on that: um, Are you finding that there's a pretty large appetite? amongst larger enterprises for like these types of solutions oh yeah absolutely i think that's what's getting me actually most excited but it's kind of the frustration also because i can't talk about it until it's out <laughs> so it's like there, i don't know there was one time where uh one of my colleagues john nehas he's he's a uh, senior bd director and he was like hey Jay, you want to hop on this call to talk to these guys? And I was like, holy shit, are we actually talking to these guys? Like, this is incredible. And I was like, are they actually talking about us uh, with us for, to do something? Or are they just like, 
you know, trying to spin some wheels and, and use some of their, like, R&D budget to, like, say that they tried blockchain or something. And it actually was something serious. So that's the one uh, example I kind of keep bringing up. And then what's, what's going to happen, I think, in enterprise, and we're seeing this already, especially with uh, some of these examples that I'm kind of alluding to, is it's very much a peer recommendation game. Um, and so you're going to have, let's say, like, decision makers at these enterprises usually... Uh, like the innovation department or even like the tech department, they're going to create a proof of concept most likely, or even do like totally live production deployments. But let's just call it even a proof of concept. So minimally you're going to have a proof of concept and then eventually you're going to do it. And then you're going to talk about it naturally in conferences amongst your peers, uh, even with clients and say like, Hey, this is what we did. And especially if you're a uh, client's, client facing or client services organization, you're going to have an, a vested interest to try and productize that offering. So imagine if you had an enterprise who was like, hey, we're the experts to create subnet deployments for all of the rest of the enterprises in the world. And so I think that's where we're likely going to lead to, hopefully. I actually have a friend at Symbion, a really good friend at Symbion too, and I was talking to him, and that's a um, enterprise only uh, blockchain company. They're pretty... Uh, they've been around for a while, but I ask, I actually asked them about like what they're seeing and a lot of or what they're seeing with their clients. And a lot of these clients are are basically just trying to streamline just kind of the basic blockchain use case, which is like minimize the intermediaries and just have a single source of truth. I still think that that's very elementary application of blockchain. But then again, like. I don't really know what's next, to be honest, or what's next and what can actually drive revenue or increase the company's margins. So I think that still needs to be uh, figured out within the enterprise side. Like they need to figure out how this is going to help make them more money. Hey, Jay, can you also touch on like some of the red tape you guys are running into? I'm super curious, like what, what type of pushback um, you're receiving from some of these companies? Yeah, it's not, it's not really pushback. It's mostly just like, hey, if we need to do this, we need to go through like 50 lawyers and all of them are above the age of 80. And so <laughs> that's kind of the main thing. <laughs> Jeez, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so as we go on, it should get easier as more you know where younger people come in and start understanding and yeah yeah but damn oh so if uh if anyone out there is in law school uh you may you may be in high demand if you know a little bit about blockchain totally good i i actually think that i also think the same thing with anything in general like uh even like if you have a technical skill or even non-technical like marketing like i'm this year is the year that i've gotten the most recruiting dms to date since 2016. It was like, it's like almost like laughable how many people ping, like, hey, uh, this is like a, you know, early stage blockchain company who needs a head of marketing, or this is even like a fully funded, like Series C who needs a CMO. Like, it's honestly kind of insane. And in all of my, so like, just being in the space this long, I also have just friends who are crushing it in their respective uh, skill sets. So I have a lot of Solidity Dev friends. They're obviously always high in demand. Law, lawyer friends, same thing. Um, if you're able to really, really understand blockchain and, and kind of the ecosystem that surrounds it and really understand what you do as, as a professional, that's what makes you super valuable. And I think one of the things that helps me stand out in the pack is I know about these products and then I know we kicked up this call off with telling you guys that I'm in all the yield farms. Like you're not seeing like many marketers in the space really get down and dirty and use these products. So a lot of the conversation I'm having at Ava Labs also is like, hey guys, this is a huge, huge pain point in product. We need to fix this. Because at the end of the day, like marketing can do a lot and it can definitely um, push the, the product into areas that, that are all across the world with, with really good global marketing strategy. But at the end of the day, if the product sucks, the house of cards is inevitably going to fall and, and everything is going to catch up to itself. And, and you see that all the time. Um, and so I know like right now you're seeing a lot of these top 20, top 30 projects. And a lot of the times there's, there are people that are on, on the Twitter sphere and online saying like, how the hell does X project like gain this much attention? Like they don't even have anything. It's like, well, because maybe there's a little bit of luck. Maybe there's a little bit of marketing. There's so many different 
variables that ladder up to a success or the appearance of success. But at the end of the day, like think about how you compare the CMC top 100 year over year. It changes year over year. And every time the projects that have really strong fundamentals or really strong user experiences on the DAP side, or not even really strong, um, you can just be decently strong because the bar in crypto is so damn low. And so I think that's where you're going to find, I think, the most success and I think finding the balance between hype versus uh, like actual tangible value is, is something that I'm trying to always, always find a balance in. <laughs> Sorry, me too. I look for the little okay. icon to see who's going to say. Oh, I didn't know uh, what you were going to say. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, uh, Jay, that's awesome for sharing. Um, yeah, go ahead, me too. And before, because I may, I think I'm gonna switch the topic to the next portion. Okay, I just want wanted to also cover like uh, the C chain and like the smart contracts within the C chain and how they're kind of different uh, than the smart contracts on Ethereum and the the, the advantage of using um, Avalanche versus Ethereum. Yeah, so it's actually not different at all uh, from the technical perspective, but here's what makes it better. So it's not different because Avalanche C chain runs the Ethereum virtual machine. So it runs the same environment of Ethereum. It doesn't have state, but it is running the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, and so that basically means Solidity is the programming language that you that developers can use to build applications on top of it. And so the main reason why it's better is just because you get the power uh, and performance of the Avalanche consensus. And so basically you just get a faster Ethereum um, and more performant. So if you think about like, uh, like really high times of demand on Ethereum, I, I remember like, and I use Ethereum from time to time too, don't get me wrong. So, but it was like 50 to $100 in transaction fees. And I am very, very cognizant that I'm in a very privileged place to be okay with paying that amount. But think about uh, like like the real world use case, like in in banks even, like you're not even paying fees unless you overdraft or you're sending a wire. Like that's like the only time you pay fees. Like one of the things that I actually talked about recently was, if, let's say you are using a DAP for the first time and you need to approve the trading of the tokens and that costs a transact or that costs gas fees. That's like saying like, oh, if you have a Chase bank account and you want to use uh, like if you want to use kind of like the credit score feature, <laughs> you have to pay a fee <laughs> and you also have to pay a fee for like all the other little features that exist in your bank account. I don't think there's anything wrong with the way uh, like these smart contract platforms are, are, um, are designed. But the thing that is challenging is like, how do you communicate that to people that aren't necessarily evangelized by the crypto ethos. And so how do you convince them to do that? And I think that's something that we're still trying to figure out. But in, in terms of, um, again, like going back to what uh, the question was when it comes to ETH versus Avalanche, I think we're, what we're seeing right now is a lot of people getting frustrated with the ETH environment, like I said, with my anecdote. And so they're able to try Avalanche with a snap of a finger. Now there's a few things that I think are throttling it's like real ins insane adoption i think and the, those are things that we're working on right now so it's not like a huge huge issue long term but one being exchange liquidity and exchange liquidity it just takes some time honestly is what what we found out and and i think we all knew that and also what from my previous experiences i i, I knew that a little bit too but even so like we've talked to we're, some of the exchanges that are gonna list avox in in the near future like the next month or so We've been in conversations for almost a year now. And so it's, it's honestly insane. Like, especially in bull runs, you have companies that are like, hey, can we skip the line if we pay $5 million? And so you just have this kind of cash grab too. So it's like, of course, Avalanche um, and or Avalabs rather, or Avalabs and Avalanche actually for that matter, both, both entities have raised a significant amount of money. So I'm not saying that we don't have the money to... Uh, to come, kind of compete with everybody. But at the same time, we also have to be very, very careful with how you spend money. Because I've also 
seen companies, uh, even companies that I've advised um, also help uh, do marketing consulting. I would say uh, like conservatively, maybe like 50 to 60% of them are no longer here. And that's just because they burned through their money and they either disappeared or they got acquired. Yeah, I, I can totally relate to that. I do uh, digital marketing in IRL, and uh, <laughs> I've definitely seen, uh, I would say, a lot, a lot of marketing, too, is if the KPIs aren't aligned properly to the company goals, uh, you can really fall into that trap of just spending and seeing a uh, little, little return or, or not meeting your overall objectives. Uh, Chase, you want to switch? Um, job. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah we can hear you. Hey. Yeah, um, yeah. I just wanted to kind of like switch the conversation because you know we had talked about uh, DeFi and Jay. You had talked about like you being kind of a, a degen in the space. Um, so like on Avalanche, like what are what are some of the advantages of using um, the protocol for DeFi right now? Like what are some things on the platform? Yeah, I think the main things, two main things, would be. Uh, transaction finality or settlement speeds, it's under one second um, and is continuously getting Im- improved as, as all of the other platform improvements come along. And then the second one is cost. So right now, uh, like contract chain or, or, or other, just making a general, but like specific to contract chain, but avalanche transaction fees on the contract chain are fixed um, at 225 GUE in terms of Avox, though. That's also the confusing thing. I don't know. I think we we kind of, the development team chose to stick with Gwei because that's what everybody um, is familiar with. But that 225 is fixed just to kind of keep things stable, at least while we're still making improvements. The idea is to make, uh, to introduce dynamic fees in the near future. And so that should uh, really switch it up a bit in, in, and not just keep it at a fixed rate because that's, that's not really that useful for a world that's very dynamic. And are, are you seeing, um, like, uh, what, like, what are some of the like DEXs on Avex or like, you know, are you seeing like borrowing lending, like that ecosystem, uh, being built out? Yeah. So the first challenge was really to, f- to have products that had liquidity to just establish price discovery. That, so basically, you have a lot of AMMs that kind of flooded the Avalanche space. Some are native to Avalanche and, and only only going to uh, continue developing on Avalanche. Others are cross-chain. So now we're, we're seeing this tipping point. Um, for, so the AMM kind of life cycle started in January 2021. That's when we started seeing like a lot of these AMMs start popping up. And from there, you have liquidity. But you also need to make sure that these AMMs are are actually legitimate. Uh, the the mechanism that mechanisms that they have in place are are strong. Um, Uniswap, of course, is is innovating in a different direction. You have then Bancor doing a different thing, and you have all these different guys that have been in the space trying a, a, all these different ideas to to really maximize the user experience and and also maximize the the value given to the end user. So I think we're not. Avalanche, the Avalanche ecosystem is not quite there yet, but I think we are getting to that. Now that we have liquidity, um, or at least as a good a good amount of liquidity in the Avalanche ecosystem, we're seeing then a lot of these new uh, like primit- financial primitives beyond just peer-to-peer trading or trading come into the fold. And so I think lending will be the first um, DAP that's going to be replicated in the Avalanche ecosystem. Um, derivatives, we have, I think we have some derivatives platforms. Um, but again, like I think the big players are what we're really gunning for. It just like, again, if you're a big player in this bull market, you're being engaged by 50,000 different layer ones. <laughs> and so I think that's kind of, uh, it's kind of this like bidding war, if you will. Um, and so it's either let's leverage, let's leverage the relationships that we have. And I think one of the strongest um, one of the strongest kind of, uh, I guess, components of the Apple Labs team is a lot of us come from experience, whether it be crypto or traditional finance or, or just traditional enterprises. And so I think that is something that isn't really quantifiable, but is something that I think will help us succeed and accelerate our progress much quicker in the long term, in, 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 um, in the long term. And it's 
like one example I would say is like the the thing that I was talking about earlier. Like my friend Gal, he's the product lead at MetaMask. If I didn't have him as a really close friend, I would never have been able to have this conversation with the MetaMask team to figure out how best to maximize the the Avalanche user experience there. So um, hopefully this will pay off soon, sooner rather than later. Awesome. Uh, Connor, I saw you, uh, I think you waved. Did you have a question? Oh uh, yeah. I had a few questions earlier. You brought up like when you're talking to other people, it's difficult to explain blockchain technology, let alone three blockchain technology. Do you have like, amongst the company kind of like an elevator pitch for the difference in blockchain versus three blockchain that you kind of tell people or do you need to really sit people down to really have them get it yeah i think we've tried a bunch of different things i think it's not gonna really stick until we i don't know maybe maybe like later this year we'll start seeing some stronger signals i think the the baseline is is what i said earlier about like platform chain, P chain, exchange chain, X chain, exchange meaning like you just send payments peer to peer and then contract chain as the C chain as the smart contracts chain. I think what might happen is there's just going to be certain projects that only care about the contract chain and nothing else. And if the contract chain can be improved to the, to the point where it is performing at parity or close to the performance of the X chain, then maybe they might not care about ever venturing out to the X chain to use its high throughput capabilities from the transfers perspective. On the flip side, you also have, um, maybe you have uh, instances where you have an entity that just wants to send and receive assets or information as quickly as possible, and they don't care about totally ordered blockchains like the contract or smart contract blockchains, in which then they totally can use a DAG um, in this case. So I have a feeling that's probably what's going to happen. And then if the transfers are seamless too, then ultimately it's not going to matter for the end user. So I'm hoping in, from the end user's perspective, they'll just be able to be like, all right, well, Avalanche is just this holistic environment, and I'm not going to have to care about the the underlying chains. And I think Another example, like I think I talked about TCP IP earlier, but another example I like to give is like if people know email protocols, there's POP3 and IMAP. You don't, I, I, and if you don't know it, that's exactly the point. You know how email works, but you don't know about POP3 and IMAP. And they do slightly different functions. Um, and one came after the other. So maybe one is technically a, a, an innovation a, 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 a building upon the first. Um, but yeah, so I'm hoping that that's kind of the future. Because otherwise, if we're if we're still in the space where like we have you know like wrapped Bitcoin with WBTC, and then all of a sudden you have a million other wrapped Bitcoins where it's like different letters in front of it, you're, you're just going to have this mess of tokens, and I don't think that's useful for anyone. So that's what I'm hoping, I, I guess, in the future. That makes sense. And I guess my secondary question is like on the introduction of the white paper, the first goal listed is building application specific blockchain spanning permissioned quote-unquote private and permissionless public deployments what is the general difference and benefit in private versus public deployments on blockchain tech like what why are people going private versus public with a project yeah private's just basically the way you run your or the way you, i guess like what your worldview is and, and how you go to market effectively. So I'm speaking on behalf of companies. And so there's like certain companies, let's say like uh, like a like a big four accounting firm, for example, they're not going to want to put any of their data for everyone to see right now. We're just not there yet at all. Maybe in some sort of future, some uh, a little bit utopian perhaps, but maybe there's just this uh, world where everyone is forced to be transparent because that's just the status quo. But as you guys know, with social media, all this data harvesting and all that stuff, we're clearly not close yet. So that's that's all it is. I don't think there's really, I personally don't think there are that many benefits one or the other. The public one is a little bit more uh, appealing to the masses. So if you think about like the Web2 timelines, you had a lot of early companies trying to create the internet like xerox and ibm they were two big companies that were trying to to create this connected web and at the end of the day the the open one um one and, and that's what we're using today 
are you seeing more uh, are more companies starting private or public or is it a mix of both i think most established enterprises are starting private i i don't really know of that many that are totally using public blockchains um that's you have like the the enterprise focused blockchain companies like r3 uh quorum i guess is is technically part of consensus or ethereum now um it kind of went back and forth. I actually didn't understand that trajectory, to to be honest. Um, and then, and then, like uh, I guess I don't know. The other, the other uh, enterprise blockchains are all private. Yeah, kind of going off the uh, institutional use. Um, what about governments? Like, what is what is government usage of um, Avalanche, Avalanche versus like other platforms kind of look like? Yeah, so the the one public government that actually uses is using Avalanche right now from a proof of concept perspective is is um this this munis- municipality in Mexico called Quintana Roo. They are uh, basically putting on their l- legal documentation on a private chain, um, private Avalanche blockchain, and that basically allows them to have a single source of truth to basically minimize the the back office headaches and and just costs for that matter. I'm actually not quite sure how that initiative is going, to be honest. I'm, we're supposed to be hearing an update sometime in the near future, so hopefully I'll be able to talk a little bit more confidently about what's going on there. On the flip side, I mean, you're still having conversations like from governments for CBDCs. I think that's an interesting use case and how that um, how they need to be tackling that. So like Goon, he was talking to the Bank of England for some time and really figuring out what they were trying to accomplish. Very early uh, kind of conversations and just kind of like a, uh, like an, a brainstorm more or less. But um, I think the connection has been made and uh, the relationship has been built fairly strongly. So what we're seeing on the Avalab side in terms of strategies, like, hey, let's keep all these relationships warm, kind of like traditional marketing lead generation and then when it comes time where perhaps i don't know maybe when subnets are out or maybe there's another advanced capability that we're we're going to be deploying on top of subnets that's when we can attack it doesn't really make sense when your product is in the eyes of enterprise at least like half baked or a little bit riskier to to put all your resources there it makes more sense when you're we're totally primed because that's kind of when you when you have the best shot to succeed Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. And I, and I know one of the other things as well is like um, that's see on the list of kind of like benefits or use cases is intellectual property. And I know that's kind of like a really big thing in terms of like the macro environment between how countries compete competitively with each other. Um, yeah. How how does how does uh, Avalanche kind of like bring a solution in terms of like protecting intellectual property? Yeah, so I think like this is just a general blockchain commentary. I, it, the the tough part is the block blockchain or technology in general can't uphold law itself, and so that's actually a question that I keep asking a lot of my lawyer friends. Is like one one example would be NFTs, right? Like NFTs, the narrative kind of got carried away in my opinion. It was saying like, oh well, NFTs is truly verifiable and you own it. But is it legally enforceable? And I don't think that's actually been addressed on mass, in my opinion. And so just because you have an NFT doesn't mean you own it in the eyes of the law is my, is my take. And so I'm trying to figure out like how that exactly works. Now, from a philosophical perspective, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so this is kind of just like kind of thinking out loud a little bit. And I've thought about this um, quite quite for quite some time. But I think the interesting thing about blockchain technologies, it's all verifiable by anybody, at least if it's public or permissionless. So in theory, if you had anything that needed to be traced back, for example, like maybe there's something, some like legal implications that uh, I guess that that exist in in like a, a transfer that wasn't authorized, for example, or a transfer that was authorized and then someone is calling calling uh, in, in the court saying like, hey, this wasn't actually transferred or like someone's lying in the chain of, 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 of the transactions, if you will, then at least you can bring to court and say like, look at this ledger and take a look at the paper trail that exists. And, and, and perhaps that's something that could be used as evidence. But again, yeah, just, just a thought there.
Chase, did you have anything else you wanted to cover? Or can I switch? Uh, yeah, go for it. Sorry, I'm getting a I'm getting a phone call, so it keeps like popping. Oh, uh, you're good. You're good. You're good. Uh, kind of switching um, switching gears a little bit here. Um, we were we were uh, on your website and we saw the uh, the rival um, product. Can you uh, talk to us a little bit about that project and and like the plans that you guys have around that? Yeah. So rival, simply put, give basically creates a stock market for litigation funding, and so you can basically participate in the fundraising event. Uh, of a litigation. And usually these fundraising events occur if like uh, someone needs just a lot more capital to fight that legal battle. And what ends up happening in this, in today's day, pre-rival, I guess, is you basically only have high net worth individuals or large institutions able to participate. That's kind of the narrative that persists in all of finance, to be honest. Um, and, and of course, uh, equities has been a little bit more democratized than, than before. And so I think that's where we're seeing the progress points. So same thing with litigations, you're going to be able to participate. So, uh, one of the exam- one of the, the first cases that we're working on is a case called Apotheo. And, um, I, I think this is what happened, but Apotheo involved a farmer. Um, I think it, he was a hemp farmer. And I think the federal government torched his hemp crops and destroyed like millions and millions of crops. And so he's trying to sue either the federal government or the state government. I can't remember. Um, I do actually have to look back at that. But basically, this farmer is now saying needs a lot more assistance in fighting this legal battle and obviously can't possibly fund it himself. And so he could then call on to anyone that's passionate about trying to set a precedent for uh, I guess people in a situation where someone unlawfully destroys your crops and that's where you have rival and any one of us could be participating in and basically buying tokens that uh, give you the chance to 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 benefit from the upside or if there is no upside then you just simply lose your principal but that's kind of the mechanisms that are at play at Rival. So actually, what's really exciting about that is right now we are pushing forward on Rival uh, as as much and as quickly as possible. So we are actively working on that with Republic. So Republic, uh, I don't know if everyone here knows Republic, but they're basically like a crowdfunding platform for uh, regulated securities. And then we're also working with a law firm called uh, Roche LLP. They're based out of New York. And so we're just trying to figure out what this exactly looks like at, um, once it's out in the public. So, uh, yeah, that, that was going to be my question was like, how does it work? Like, is it going to be like a DAO type setup? But it seems like it will kind of be like a, uh, like a, you know, like you see real estate tokenized right now and you can buy yeah. like shares of the tokens. So it's like basically yep. a tokenized litigation and there may be like 10,000 tokens in total and you can yep. like buy buy owning share of the yeah exactly okay. exactly and what's funny is like t- tokenized real estate like i was i was for about a year and a half that was like 50% of my time working on trying to figure out deals in the real estate game and and i mean people can google it but we did a deal with Ryan Serhant million dollar listing through my former company and what ended up happening is we tokenized uh, i think the debt of a apartment building in Manhattan in East Village. And sounds cool, right? And it is cool. I think it's still cool. But the problem is, and here's the problem. At the time, this was about two years ago, you could actually buy the debt with DAI. And you could, the next step was really to have the the trickle down economics of the investment. So if you were an investor, an LP in the real estate or uh, in this specific piece of real estate, then technically you could also have like, let's say like rent payments in the building or even like other investors that join and all of that capital flow is, will would happen in an automated way because it's all programmed in these digital, digitized tokens. Then the problem that I'm alluding to, and here's the exact problem was no one wanted to buy the die. You're not gonna like, if you're talking about real estate investors, a lot of them are, are, are on average a little bit older and they're less, 
uh, keen on taking risk. That's why they're in real estate, arguably. And so when you come to a big uh, room and you're and you're talking to a lot of older investors and and people that might not know crypto at all, and say, hey, would you love to participate in buying this debt by using MakerDAO's multi-collateral DAI? And you obviously will never get anyone to bite, at least two years ago. Um, so I'm hoping that that landscape changes a little bit in the near term, but I think there are still like, like, again, I think there's two main things, how to tell the story. Like even I'm telling the, retelling the story and I'm having a tough time because there's so many pieces involved. The second piece is again, UX, like what happens once you have this die? Like, do you just ha custody it in your ledger and like hate your life because the user experience sucks? Or do you put it in your MetaMask um, where you have a lot of capital at risk because it's on a hot wallet. So these are some of the things that I still need to get figured out in order for it to be mainstream ready. hundred percent. Um, Chase, super high. Connor, any additional questions? I have a few um, audience questions that were submitted to us. We want to move there. Uh, that's uh, for me. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's just, do it. Yeah, hit those. Okay. Uh, one of the questions is asking, is Ari Jules potentially going to be an outside advisor for Ava, Ava Labs? I don't know if you can comment is that on like that. A chain, but... Is that like a chain link question? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> they want to know. <laughs> um, I mean, I think Goon's close with Ari, actually, but that doesn't, don't take that to mean anything. I, uh, for, for what I know, nothing has been public about that. So, yeah, I guess no comment. <laughs> <laughs> 100%. Uh, someone's asking, um, when roughly do you think like the subnets uh, will, will come out? I don't know if you guys have released an official. Uh, yeah, so so one of the, the things that I've been trying to push the product team on is getting this damn roadmap out. And we're in the final, final stretches, but I don't want to cite a date just because it'll get held against me, but it is coming out very soon. So that's where it'll have some clarity as to what the timelines look like. Okay, that, that makes sense. Um, someone's asking, um, how does Avalanche differ itself from Solana? And they're also interested in how it's how it will compete with HBAR. I don't know if you're familiar with either of those. Yeah, I don't I, I mean, I know, it, like, I used to trade HBAR OTC, but I actually don't know that much about HBAR. <laughs> um, and Solana... I think what we can do that might be more useful is is really just put out a, a, a kind of like an informational piece that is as objective as possible. I think there's a lot of cherry picking in the space with with metrics, and we're seeing that a lot. I'm not necessarily saying Solana is doing that um, only, but I'm also just thinking it might be more useful to have it in in content form. So what I want to definitely definitely do is is have just kind of this objective comparison with all of the major um, smart contract platforms. I'll look back at HBAR again because I can't remember if they were smart contract enabled or not. If so, I'll just include that in the mix. And um, yeah, maybe I might ping you guys once that's out, hopefully sooner rather than later. Cool. No worries about that. Um, someone is asking, uh, can you talk about the invalid minting bug? Um, and was that an issue you had... Uh, was that a double speed issue or uh, a double mint issue? Yeah, so that mint, I think they're referring to, is it the bridge? Do you know if it's the bridge minting bug? Either way, it was burned. I, uh, and I have I have the transaction ID somewhere to to prove that it was burned. But I believe it was, if it's referring to the mint minting issue that occurred when the av one of the avalanche to ethereum bridges just wasn't operating correctly and it accidentally minted additional tokens to certain people and so what the avalanche foundation did was take the amount that was minted and completely burned it okay and they're also asking like does this uh does this problem get fixed um by increasing the number of validators uh, if it's relating to the bridge, it 
doesn't have anything to do with validators. Okay. This was uh, what ended up happening is the network did not stop. That is a very clear, uh, very important distinction that I want to make. And I think it was really hard to navigate because one of the things that I'll mention at that time is in February is when the network started slowing down, it was almost like the whole team got punched in the face. So when you get punched in the face, what do you do? You're completely, completely dazed. And you're also working like round the clock. I didn't sleep for actually three days that day, that week. Like the, there's a core team of Vivo that didn't sleep for three days. It was actually a little bit insane. It was like last week of February or something. Um, so what ended up happening is, again, the platform started slowing down, but did not stop. And so that's where the core development team had to really focus in on trying to get it back up. And there's actually, and, and the reason why I'm not going to necessarily go into it is because I'm going to definitely mess up how to explain it because it's a little bit technical, but there is a blog post that explains all of this, um, um, and, and what actually happened. Um, it's on our medium if people are curious. And I think if people actually have specific questions, the engineering team can explain at a much better, uh, at, at greater lengths than I possibly could. Um, so definitely would reach out to those guys. 100%. Yeah, definitely definitely check out the medium. Um, I'm going to take a look at that as well. Um, someone's asking... Uh, how are you attempting to decentralize a network uh, when proof of stake causes natural propensities for centralization since whales have a disproportionate effect on the token? Yeah, so I actually have seen that criticism for some time and I, I've been meaning to look into like what exactly th that means. Like I get it face value, but uh, honestly going to have to to figure out like what my response is there instead of actually just making something up. Yeah. And, and we'd rather you do that than make something yeah. up. So we don't Oh, totally. Try. Totally. I trust me. There's people in this space that don't have the confidence to say no or say that you don't know. And I'm definitely not one of them. So <laughs> I, I feel like it's more admirable to say that you don't know rather than try to make something up. Oh, totally. Yeah. There's no way you could possibly know everything in the space. The space is just like, you know, ever growing every day. Like I remember, I remember when yield farming came out, and I was like, "What is this new stupid little thing?" That uh, like I was just saying is stupid because the name was so funny. Um, and I was like, "Oh, I get what this is. This is a kickback. This is basically just putting bonuses on top of your your uh, pools, <laughs> which is totally fine. I think it's an incentive mechanism. I, I totally get it. Yeah, hundred percent. I could always DM you the question to see you have it. Um... Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely so. I mean, what's uh, separately like? What's interesting about this, uh, the base space group is like this is very a lot more casual than I thought, and I think I, I like the, the kind of like group that you guys have cultivated. It's, it's not like, it's not like the suits group. It seems unless you guys are all secret suits, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just like you know an imposter here. The psyop um, work boys. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're in. <laughs> Yeah, it could be. But I think the other thing that's nice is like you guys clearly have depth in in the understanding. So what we call like crypto like initiated or heavily initiated is I think what matters most to us now because if we're able to win the hearts and minds of of the people that care the most, then the rest is going to be easy because first of all you're going to harness the power of community and then second of all you're going to at least discover product market fit somewhere somehow because of you guys and even even myself included and that's why i'm so passionate about the space and actually using the product so you're going to see me like you're, you're seeing me in all these different DeFi channels uh also friends with a lot of the the major DeFi projects i was also on the founding team of rap bitcoin so i remember seeing that and i remember when rap bitcoin when we first minted the first rap bitcoin i was like i think people are gonna hate this because it is centralized at least in the ethos of of like you know, kind of the libertarian DeFi type folks. Um, because at the end of the day, wrap Bitcoin has to be minted by merchants and those merchants are institutions. And then all of a sudden you had MSB, uh, money, uh, money services risks um, or money transmitting risks, sorry. And and then there's all these risks. So also some institutions didn't want to mint any WBTC and then you had BitGo minting predominantly the all, uh, most of the WBTC. And then what's crazy is a couple of days ago, Wrap Bitcoin 
one percent of all bitcoins in existence is now on ethereum that's to me so 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 cool and one of the things that shows like you could have on paper certain hypotheses of what's going to happen and you could be absolutely sure and i remember i used to say like i don't know if rap bitcoin is going to take off i think a more trustless thing is going to take off but at the end of the day it's like no one gave a shit and that's something that you always have to kind of check yourself with and so as much as you want to focus on this like hey we're going to live in this really happy world where everything's going to be purely decentralized that's realistically not going to be the first step it's probably not even going to be the second or third step it's probably going to be like the hundredth step um, and in between are all of kind of like the different variations of what decentralization looks like. A hundred, a hundred percent. I mean, I, uh, we, we appreciate the kind words about the space. I mean, this just started as us like playing around, <laughs> um, and we, we slowly just formed an audience around, around the spaces and it's been really cool to just bring on a ton of projects and provide like that connection with crypto Twitter and, and provide, um, education for the community. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like he was saying, it started off, we were drawing on my whiteboard, as a lot of people know the story, uh, a plan to defeat the elite. <laughs> it was like <laughs> six of us. And then you know, it turns into where we're bringing these protocols on and like spreading knowledge. And it's just really, truly amazing. And we do appreciate you coming on, Jay. It was, you know, it was a blast talking to you and hearing from you. Um, and I definitely am more bullish on AVAX now from hearing. Uh, it's, it's usually easier to understand a project when someone explains it to you rather than, you know, going and reading about oh, it. Oh, yeah, totally. Sometimes, totally. Sometimes you're in there and reading and you're like, oh, fuck, it's just, there's so much information. But yeah. Um, yeah, so definitely appreciate you. Yeah, no, appreciate you guys having me. I think, uh, like, goes without saying, anyone here, any questions, DM me. Um, any, any feedback, DM me about that too. Just like I think, as much as I would love to make everything happen, it's 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 definitely a little bit of a slower process to just like absorb some of the information and really figure out like critically what decision makes most sense, and get kind of the approvals of of my peers as well. But at the end of the day, like we do definitely hear you. You're gonna notice like the Avalabs team. We're very very involved in community, and so even join the Telegram, and you're gonna just watch like a lot of us chime in from time to time. Um, and then also like at the end of the day, like when I personally talk, I want to be as real as possible. I'm not about to go to a conference and chill the living, living hell of avalanche. I think I want to take a middle of the road approach because at the end of the day, like a shill is a shill. People are going to know who, who that is. And I, I tend to find that the neutral voices or at least the ones that try to stay as grounded as possible are the ones that are going to, to be heard the most. And I think you're going to have more constructive conversations that way. A hundred percent. Jay, again, thank you so much for coming on the space. Um, thanks to all the listeners for tuning in. It's been it's been incredible. Jay, we do record these. Are you OK with us uh, posting on YouTube? Yeah, that's totally fine. I, I usually treat these things as, as publicly as possible. Hell yeah. Yeah, guys, uh, this episode will probably be going up um, over the weekend. We'll be dropping uh, the phase episode probably tomorrow. So if you guys did not... Uh, uh, hear the phase Eric episode uh, definitely it's it's a good one and this one is hella based I know a ton of people uh, wanted to tune in and um, yep we are, I'll be announcing tomorrow as well uh, the, the rareable episode the date and time so uh, stay tuned for that and uh, super high Chase Connor appreciate you guys speaking and Jay man uh, I'll, I'll send you over those follow up questions just so you can have them uh, yeah and uh, yeah, if you find any answers, I'll, I'll just uh, DM them to the, the appropriate people. Awesome.